Are we on? Yes, sir. Okay, so uh, Tom Munnicke, I'm starting a presentation on uh, just introduction to the um, universal health exchange language. My point is I think we're missing some foundational capabilities in medical informatics. And uh, there's just this hole in the fabric of reality to, uh, to uh, paraphrase Douglas Hofstetter. But um, and the key to that is something that David and I have been talking about for years now, and it has to do with Aristotle and his law of the excluded middle. So I, one of my favorite quotes, and I actually wrote a paper on this in 1998 for the VA, is in spite of the genius of Plato and Aristotle, their thoughts have, had, have vices which prove infinitely harmful. Since the beginning of the 17th century, almost every serious intellectual advances had to begin with an attack on some Aristotelian doctrine in logic. This is still true in the present day. So next slide. So I'll say that this is also true in medical informatics. But the basic logic is uh, three, no, three rules. Uh, a is A, identity. Everything is either A or not A. The law of the excluded middle, which I think is really the, a key component here. And nothing is, not, is both A and not A, law of non-contradiction. So this is kind of the um, foundational approach here. Next slide. And I pulled this out of a uh, journal of National Health Informatics Initiative um, in the late 90s on how to do an Aristotelian hierarchy. And I'll, I'll let you read the slide yourself. But uh, basically, it's, it's saying you have to exclude the middle, and you work your way down here, dichotomize everything, and you build this, this structure that you start with the structure, and then you try to push the, the substance into it. So David will go a little bit deeper into that, but this is kind of the, the poster child for how to build a, uh, a you know, very top-down uh, dichotomous relationship, which uh, David talked about as a Boolean lattice. Next slide. So I call that the medical bell, medicine by bell curve, that we start out by saying something is A or not A, and then we reduce that to a patient having A or not, and then we study A if it causes disease X, again through random clinical trials or whatever, controlling for everything else in the picture. And then we reduce A's effect on X as a Gaussian distribution. So we assume this normal distribution, and that's the medicine by bell curve. So my point is, I think, and I'm open to discussion or argument about this, is that we've had this fundamental problem in that we're over-specifying, over-dichotomizing, and then trying to reason from these relationships that need to be treated in a broader contextual manner. So next. So what if he was wrong? What if there is a middle um, to the, uh, between A and not A? And what if the response isn't a bell curve? What if it's a power law distribution? And what if something way out on the tail is fatal and uh, everything else is wonderful? Wouldn't it be nice to know if you're in the 1% fatal category? Uh, what if it's history dependent? What if what is that the path dependent logic, path dependent logic here, that you just can't smooth out with random control trials? And how do we understand these responses in the very complicated array of mind, body, immune system, homeostasis, environmental and genomics, and everything else that's happening? But this idea of having a single variable characterizes a mean, and your value is the standard of deviation from the mean, I, I think is way way oversimplifying and needs to be reconsidered. Yes, John? One more question on the slide. One more question. What if there's path-dependent hysteresis? Hysteresis? Exactly. Oh, OK. Uh, yeah, so I would have. Magnetic phenomena are often is. Yeah. OK. Path-dependent hysteresis, add that to my chart. I, I would have subsumed it in my uh, <laughs> other one. But yeah, no, I, uh, for dosage and drugs, too, right? Um, lots of things. Oh, yeah, caffeine. Lots, lots of things. Pacemakers. Pacemakers. Yeah. Anyway, the, this no, assumption of, uh, the assumption of linearity and discreteness and specificity is number one. And number two is we seem to be trying to cure it with greater specificity and greater dichotomization and uh, uh, greater um, ICD-10 codes. Okay, next slide. So two frameworks, I'm calling up the pigeonhole framework, pigeonhole pr uh, paradigm versus everything is miscellaneous. Pigeonhole is a place for everything and everything in its place. Uh, you start <coughs> with structure, and then the substance is crunched into that structure. So you start with the Dewey Decimal System, and you put your books on the shelves according to the Dewey Decimal System, which works great if you're doing certain things. Everything miscellaneous is everything is in context. You start with the substance, 
and then you add the structure. Uh, the Google's approach and the digital library initiative that actually started Google from ARPA way back when. So I talked to uh, um, Gio Wiederhold. I have a video on him out there. He talks a bit about that. And we'll be hearing from Peter Norvig, who is uh, probably the preeminent everything is miscellaneous uh, thinker in the world. Has Gio been enjoying his 10 years of retirement? Oh, he's working harder than ever is before, he? yeah. Oh, yes, and he just referenced that videotape last week and I'm a big listener. Yeah, and it's already on the National Library of Medicine uh, thing. We're talking about the response to Geo Wiederhold's uh, interview. The National Library of Medicine is going to turn it into their uh, archives. So those are the two frameworks. I'm probably dichotomizing a little more than they should, but the, the idea that the, 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 from the relational database structure, which is structure first, to uh, the coding systems, to the waterfall development protocols, the, the, the idea that you can write requirements to specify how a hospital works in advance, independent of the actual operation. All these things are uh, characteristic of this hyper-reductionistic uh, environment that we find ourselves. And people measure their progress by how many reductions they've made in it. So the everything miscellaneous, uh, Wikipedia doesn't have a top. There is no predefined ontology to Wikipedia. And look at how successful that is. The web doesn't have a top. Google doesn't have a top. And uh, these are examples of very large-scale systems that have grown and evolved over time uh, through this everything is miscellaneous approach. Uh, there's a book by that title, by the way, David Weinberg, that I'd uh, recommend to everybody. Uh, David couldn't make it to the uh, Google Hangout today. OK, next slide. So the topics for the day, I'd like to say, just, let's rethink the theoretical foundations and let's do it with a clean slate approach. Let's not say we have to compare, be compatible with everything in the past. Uh, the joke and you know, God can make the world in six days because he didn't have to worry about backwards compatibility. What, what are those foundations? And that's what I'd like to lead in with, with David and him talk about. And I, I call it the context for cascades, not just causality. And a cascade is, you know, you have a snowbank and you poke it with a pinprick and it turns into an avalanche. So it's poised and it cascades. But if you go around poking snowbanks with pins, you're not going to get a, a, a Gaussian distribution. You know, so you can't go around sampling snowbanks to see if they're going to avalanche. But if you understand how cascades work and and what is poised to do something, then you can understand the pin prick better. But the the medicine by bell curve doesn't understand the, the pin prick and the avalanche. So I call that cascades, for lack of a better word. And James Fowler has adopted this in his work on social networks and Nicholas Christakis on uh, his book Connected. And in fact, James was at the meet last meeting we had with John Madison. And hopefully we'll have him for a workshop soon, too. But this whole idea of, of social networks and networks effects for health, I think, are really big. Yes, John? No. So, uh, and then. I think one of the other things is we have to look at scale. And David will be talking about the instructionist versus the selectionist approach. But do we have enough scale to, to launch into an evolutionary model of very high end, uh, fine, large grain, fine granularity network? So between VA, DOD, and possibly Kaiser, do we have a big enough user base that we could get creative and say, OK, we've got. 20 million patients, could we kind of sit on the side and look what's happening and start getting smarter with some machine algorithms or whatever? But um, I think we have to look at large scale in order for this to work. So it has to have a space that can scale up. And I, not, I don't think we're too far from that. I mean, VA and Kaiser have already been collaborating on uh, Exchange. So I think if we came up with some really good ideas and a good foundation and a few smart people, I think we could. Uh, come up with a skunk work. The goal of the discussion today is what, what are these foundations? Can we come up with something that's solid, that describes a new way, that's open and, and, and smart enough to get us forward? And if so, what's the infrastructure necessary to do it? And we have links to Kaiser, VA, and DOD, fairly, you know, near, nearest neighbor links at least then you know, the possibility is to, to talk about a, uh, some kind of way forward. Uh, I've always done well as a Skunk Works uh, manager, and uh, they've worked with small groups. 
Vista was a skunk works, uh, about 10, 12 people did it. The CHCS was uh, skunk works until the DOD got a hold of it. Uh, the web... You might move, no, you might want to just move it a little bit ahead of you. It's under your chin. Okay. Yeah. This way? Yeah. So uh, the web was just URL, HTTP, and HTML. It wasn't a skunk works, but it's just a very small group. And the wiki was just a few lines of code by Ward Cunningham. So the question is, what could we do with the, uh, a, a new model of this? And can we come up with a small number, what I'll call unencumbered thinkers, uh, people that aren't locked into specific um, agendas, and the stakeholders are the ones that are going to be uh, disrupted, and maybe they're not the ones that we want to have thinking on this. Uh, broaden the scope of, to include patients, providers, and a community. It's a little bit like thinking of Wikipedia community instead of Wikipedia software. The PHP code that runs Wikipedia is entirely different than the community that runs it, so that uses it. So the software just needs to be good enough to trigger this community approach and, and great, build it up. Uh, provide a basis for future information needs. Uh, I don't think we're ready for uh, pandemics, uh, uh, genomics, uh, whatever else, but we, we don't have the tools for that. Uh, and again, how do we reach a critical mass of network scale so that we can move to a, an evolutionary uh, selectionist model, as David will be talking about? And finally, uh, Monarchy's law that I noticed 30 years ago was that software productivity varies with the square of the distance from Washington, uh, D.C., not Seattle. So uh, increase it. increases with. The, it's not one over R squared. Yeah, uh, is it increases. Yeah. So anyway, uh, you go inside the Beltway, and it's a whole, other, whole other world. It's totally top-down power structures and K Street lobbyists and everything. And I just need to do it here, so I'm volunteering this as a home base for this idea. So that's my presentation that I wanted to open up with. Uh,